Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Baxley Andreessen. She had a dad with younger onset Alzheimer's, which is very similar to me with mom and her younger onset Alzheimer's. So we're here to talk today about warning signs and what you need to look for even in a younger person with um, possibly having memory issues. So thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So let's start out by you telling us about your dad and who he was before his diagnosis. Yeah, so uh, my dad, he had me when I was, when he was 30, just to kind of give you an idea of our age difference. Um, he grew up in Northern California and his mother passed away very early as well when I was about three from brain cancer. Mm. And um, he grew up and also like, he was very creative, a very theatrical person. He went to college for theater with my mother and uh, they were like in San Francisco and New York, kind of around the whole AIDS and Basquiat, whole, that whole thing. Um, and his dad has still still alive has dementia i believe it's frontal lobe um did he have a stroke not not that we're aware of i we think he may have had a stroke vascular dementia is from a stroke frontal temporal dementia is something else i get all confused there's lots of dementias Uh, there yeah no i'm i am no expert (laughs) so he's still alive he's been on hospice i believe for about eight months now uh, but yes, yeah, so my father started showing signs, I, I think 10 years before he passed, before he died. And he was diagnosed four and a half years before his death. And it was really tricky to get that done. And he was always really scared. He had a lot of fear of ending up the way that his father did. And so I can relate scary. my maternal grandmother had no memories at the end of her life and we're not sure if it was she had a brain aneurysm that leaked for three months oh wow yeah it's like the doctors never listened to her telling them i never get headaches i've had a headache for three months that's how long it took them to like listen to her which is super frustrating and my maternal great-grandmother also had at the time what they called senile dementia so my mom didn't want to end up like her mom. She told me that a lot. And she has. <laughs> we're, we're, she's declined quite a bit over this summer, which is the 2019. And now we're dealing with other health issues, which never ever crossed my mind as a possibility. So it's, it's been a fun last month. Oh, yeah. It is interesting, the uh, plateaus and the steep declines kind of waiting for those those new I don't even know the word for it but those new action items of all of a sudden like oh he was threatening someone with a knife and now he's in a mental ward because he's not safe for other people but he thought he was practicing for Macbeth you know oh my (laughs) just things like that that's interesting um yeah I call it like I was surprised my mom declined fairly dramatically the beginning of May and she seems to have declined again and previously she would decline and then just plateau and be at the same place for a long time we've been dealing with this for about 20 years oh wow yeah so it's interesting because I've said all along you know I'm done I'm really ready to be done (laughs) and these new health issues might accelerate the being done part and now it's like oh wait I think I'm still ready. <laughs> so that's interesting. She's got a growth next to one kidney that may or may not cause kidney failure, which is what killed my dad. And then she's either got a cyst or an ovarian tumor. And she's so far gone that my biggest fear is any kind of anesthetic would just send her in any weird direction off the rails. So it's not really an option. It's the, the kidney thing that's kind of baffling. And they want me to do another ultrasound. We've done two ultrasounds and a CT scan. Now we want to do another ultrasound. It's like, ugh. 
I have things to do. I have a job. <laughs> wow. That's a yeah. long time to be a caregiver. Yeah. Well, my dad passed away two and a half years ago. And it was really obvious when he was on hospice how bad she really was because he wasn't able to be a buffer. And she was a lot worse off than I thought. They'd lived in their house for just under 48 years, seven, 47 years. So a lot of what she did daily tasks were muscle memory. You get up, put on your, you know, whatever, your knock around the house clothes is what she called them. You make your breakfast, you make your tea. I mean, she'd been in the house so long, she probably could have done it blindfolded with one hand behind her back. You know, it was just like, but you know, you don't really think about those things until, you know, she said something like, oh, would you like some tea? I'm like, oh, okay, that'd be nice because he was on hospice over the winter. And then she'd just sit there and stare at you and be like, oh, okay, I'll go make it. <laughs> you know? It's like, it was, it was interesting. And then we, we moved her into a memory care residence um, two weeks after he passed away, which seems really super traumatic, but it was the best place for her for the most part. I, I'm not sure that when you're at a better level than a lot of the other residents that they don't kind of bring you down. I don't, it's hard to know, but they take really good care of her. You know, they're very, the caregivers are all fantastic. So it allows my sister to continue working. She has school age kids and my husband and I are self-employed. So it's, you know, it, it makes conducting life still possible. But with all this, you know, the doctor's like, he knew I was out of town and he called me on my cell phone anyway. And he goes, well, I really would like to get another ultrasound the next week or so. I'm like, dude, I got stuff to do. Like, I don't have time to do all the stuff I need to do. I cannot throw her another ultrasound in. I'll figure it out. I have, um, our support group is this week, and the facilitator is a retired geriatric nurse who has also gone through what we've gone through. So I'm going to talk to her, and then mom has a neurologist appointment next week, and I will talk to her and see where she thinks we should go. So hopefully... I'll have, I'll have more information and opinions before I make this, make the next ultrasound appointment. So it's thrilling. So your dad was, um, he was in the set design. Yeah. So my dad was a set dresser on Grey's Anatomy for nine years cool. and he did some other TV shows and other films uh, before that. So he was working in the industry for a, I think over 20 oh no that's not that can't be right but definitely over 15 years um yeah he was doing that for a while and that was honestly the first signs that we had were from fellow employees fellow co-workers who were with him most of the day because these were long days 12 hour days and they had known him for a long time and noticing that he would say something and forget to bring this tool or forget to bring this thing or not do what he was supposed to do and he would have some you know conflicts with maybe his boss because he would say we told you to do this and he was like no you didn't and so they did say that they were worried that something was was wrong and my mom had noticed it too they just kind of had more like clear action items and we we're going to the doctor since 2010 or so to get him diagnosed with something. And they said depression and they said a testosterone imbalance and nothing really worked from any of those things. And they often would say, oh, but he's so handsome and he's so young. And that was really detrimental, detrimental like his appearance. And yeah, he was a handsome, young-looking guy for his age, but it really uh, did him a disservice. They wouldn't really take him seriously because he appeared to be healthy and and fine, even though everyone around him, who was around him enough, like my mother, who knew his regular behaviors, noticed certain things of his not taking initiative, certain lack of motivation, you know, just kind of going inward. So he had, there's 10 warning signs, which one of these days I will memorize. So he had basically a changes in personality was one of the signs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And then he had difficulty completing familiar tasks. So that's yeah. two out of 10. And he obviously had memory loss that disrupted daily life because he would. Oh, yeah. Um, that's to me, that's the, the main one that should never, ever be ignored. Um, did he have, he must have had challenges in planning and problem solving. He did. I mean, it, it's interesting. His, uh, a lot of his work would, you know, be set dressing and he was really good at orchestrating <laughs> curtains. And so he was creative with creating ways to hang pictures or hang ties. And yeah, I think he lost some of that. He He was very creative. He repaired pinball machines too, and was started to be able to started to forget how to how to do that, re fix cars and fix pinball machines. And you guys mentioned all of that to the doctors, and they still didn't think it was a brain issue. He hadn't gotten, I think, that far at that point that early. It was just these like subtle things of certain memory, like kind of the first couple that you mentioned the memory and the completing of the tasks like when my parents would travel together he was like at his best when he traveled like you just you know certain people just shine and he would do so much research and look into all these places to go and he was really good with languages so he would try and pick up some stuff and he would kind of take over and when they traveled to Italy to come see me he didn't get in that mode or get in that space and was more just kind of along for the ride and that you just know you're around someone enough and my mother was a bit taken by that. I hadn't really observed a change in behavior yet because that was something they did more intimately and she knew that aspect of him a lot better than I did. But um, that was her first kind of like feeling and you know, in the back of her neck, kind of like, this is a little off. This is something this is, different. Yeah. This is not usual for him at all. Like I talked to a gal that also has younger onset Alzheimer's. She was actually my very first episode. And one of the things she said is always take somebody with you to the doctor because you don't know what you don't know. And she and her husband traveled a lot for their jobs. So they weren't always together for days on end like most spouses and they went to hawaii together for two weeks and he was blown away by her memory issues and that's what triggered going to the neurologist and all that all that stuff that is required to be diagnosed so i'm assuming your mom talked him into going because he probably didn't realize he had an issue he he and yeah, he knew something was off. I think in the beginning, he maybe didn't notice it. But then looking back when he died, there were even letters that he wrote to my mother saying like, I'm so sorry, I'll get better. Please forgive me. And I think that was pre-diagnosis. Uh, for some reason, we don't date any of our letters in this family. <laughs> so we're not really sure when that was from. So he knew something was off. And yeah, I think it was his obviously it was his yeah biggest fear coming Ugh. true and so but his go ahead. had to get a diagnosis i am forgetting exactly you'll probably know we had to like pretty much beg and force and they have really great insurance for a certain type of brain scan or something because my mother was very convinced that it was some kind of dementia or something and that was how we finally got the diagnosis but it was it was expensive and we had to get his brother who's a doctor to help facilitate that even though he's in a different city but yeah it took some finagling to finally just like give us this test we think it's this yeah i never quite understand i mean financially i get it but it's like we go through all these tests to eliminate it's like we we're gonna do these tests so that we know it's not all these other things that we don't think it is that makes sense mm -hmm. and it's like could you just do the most definitive test because when my mom was when we knew she had an issue but she was refusing to go to the memory clinic she was refusing to do things that would have really cemented that she definitely had an issue they put her through all these other tests and we had one 
neuropsychologists tell her, oh, you're fine. And even my daughter, who I think was 16 at the time, would have punched that guy in the face. She knew her grandmother had an issue. So it was like, okay, could we just do the memory test that's going to tell us yes or no? And it was ridiculous. By the time she was formally diagnosed, she flunked all those memory tests with fly, flying colors. <laughs> yeah. It was like, she actually, and regular listeners know, in the summer of 2008, she did all the testing to donate a kidney to my dad and was rejected for cognitive issues. Oh, and I, I thought- I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's why I- I was a little surprised because it wasn't super obvious to outsiders. It was to family. We knew she had a problem, but she could fake it pretty good for short, short to medium-ish time, time frames. And I assumed at that point, that's when she was diagnosed. It was three years later. I was like, this is dumb. Nowadays, the doctors can be reimbursed through Medicare for doing cognitive assessments and cognitive um, planning, which isn't something that's being taken advantage of that well. You said your dad was diagnosed what year? Uh, 2015. Okay. So this, he was diagnosed before this uh, law became active. It's not quite the right word, but it's close and enough. And Medicare, <laughs> I mean, can you... If you, but if you don't have Medicare, that's or, true. He didn't because he, he wasn't was, old enough to even. He, we did get it later on. Um, I think he could have done Medi-Cal, or I forget what it's called we in other states. We ended up getting on, yeah, Medicare. Yeah, Medicare is. There's Medicare and then there's Medi-Cal. I don't know which one he would have ended up on, but I'm not sure if it's. I'm as. I'm assuming that this law also applies to private insurance, not just Medicare, but I know it applies to Medicare and it's important. And um, they're trying to, the Alzheimer's Association is trying to help people like our parents and older people, if they have a concern about their memory to not be blown off by doctors with, oh yeah, well I forget stuff too, especially older doctors might, you know, not recognize the signs. I mean, a general physician, I don't, I don't think they're trained for all of this stuff. So the Alzheimer's Association is trying to fix that. And they're using legislation to kind of help facilitate it. It's like, it's called the HOPE Act, which allows them to be reimbursed for the, um, the care planning and the cognitive assessments, whereas before they weren't, so they just didn't do them. I mean, nobody wants to work for free. Yeah. So we're, yeah. That's so it's, yeah, it's a little frustrating because it's not like Alzheimer's is rare, unfortunately. So the medical profession seems to have to catch up. Like I'm, I'm sure I've educated the general physician in, in the doctor's office my mom attends and it's not because he doesn't care or he's, you know, he's a younger guy. Uh, he seems to be very caring and, and thorough, but I just think he's clueless when it comes to my mom's 76. So he's, you know, with her age and where she's at with her Alzheimer's, anesthesia is counterintuitive because it could just send her over the edge. It could make her violent. I mean, we don't know. I mean, it alters your brain chemistry and she already has that problem. So I don't think he quite understands that. It isn't, it's hard to know. <laughs> I try not to educate too much. I try to explain what I what I'm thinking without it sounding like I'm trying to tell him how to do his job because nobody wants to hear that nonsense what other kind of signs do you th recall your mom worrying about with your dad or was it mostly the co-workers uh it was my mom too but I I think it's tricky in that it's individual so my dad was a very attentive very loving very adoring partner and my mom had uh, cancer in 2012, 2013. And my dad really didn't step up and wasn't able to help her or support her very much, which was very odd for him. And first she was really angry about it. 
because this was the first time that she had been sick with something like this. So they hadn't really necessarily had a situation like this in their marriage previously. But um, I think it's easier to see that in retrospect, that that was just further his inability to like initiate and to, yeah, to like just show up. But that was definitely part of his Alzheimer's because he's always been really a great partner and always been very active and easy to want to be there for you. So that was really alarming for her at that time. That was really hard for her. Sounds like a really crappy decade for her too. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was not ideal. It was she, not ideal. No. Is she doing fine now? She's doing all right now. Yeah. He died uh, May 31st of this year. He, um, he had several very strong declines. He had um, West Nile, I think a year or was it two years ago? I can't remember when she moved him out, but he did have West Nile a couple of years ago and that was a huge decline because we think it gave affected his brain. Sometimes West Nile can affect like almost do a type of meningitis and they took him off his uh, SSRIs because they thought it was some kind of reaction to that. And when he was sick in the hospital with his brain being fried and then coming back to where he was living at the time, he started acting erratically, had to go to a mental institution. They've, he went through that a couple times. And um, the last big decline was he got pneumonia. And I feel fortunate that several times while he was, before he got really sick with Alzheimer's, like before he was diagnosed, and then even after when he was still able to converse and still able to ride his bike, like he volunteered for a while and would go to art classes. They did talk about like his advanced directive. And so we felt very clear on how to treat this pneumonia uh, according to his wishes. He used to always tell me after we'd visit his dad that he wanted me to throw him off a bridge if he ever got like this, but I wasn't about to do that. Yeah, that's, well, it's also illegal. <laughs> it's very illegal, yeah. Yeah, so that's that's where I've been with my mom. She has said, many many times in the past in like the early 2000s well i don't want to end up like my mother and i would just be standing there like <laughs> okay what do you want me to do with you because you're gonna go there it's obvious and murder is illegal i mean it was just it was really stressful and i didn't really realize how stressful it was until i started the podcast and i started talking about it more it was like it really like kind of freaked me out and I was with her yesterday and she's at the stage where she uses the wrong words almost consistently. Now at the beginning of the summer, she would use them somewhat frequently, you know, occasionally to somewhat frequently. And you could usually figure out what she was trying to say. Now it's like words strung together in a sentence, but there's no context or historical background. I mean, it's like, no idea what you're talking about. And I would tell her, we, I was getting her ready, you know, the doctor a couple weeks ago, and she was talking about this little girl and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm trying to pick things out of her statement to try to string it together into something logical. And I finally gave that up. And I said, um, I'm confused can you tell me what it is that you were trying to say again? And she just blew up at me. I was like, okay, <laughs> that's fun. So, you know, I know exactly what she wants, which is good and bad. I've always said, and her neurologist agreed that if she got pneumonia, we'd just call hospice because what's the point of curing that just so she can die a you know, even longer death from Alzheimer's. Well, now we've got these other issues and it's like, oh, <laughs> now I get to make that decision on, do we do anything with it? And I'm pretty sure I won't, but I don't know about the kidney issue. So it's, it's a lot easier to say, oh yeah, we'll just call hospice than it is to do, which I'm sure you experienced. He w yeah, he was actually on hospice before that. Um, 
which was a big support. And he was in a board and care for the last six months because the larger home that he was in, he wasn't able to have as good of, of care. I think everyone individually there who worked was great, but they were just spread thin. And he had to be, I believe, on a higher, whatever drugs he was on was a higher amount to keep him a little bit more subdued. Mm. And uh, that, that was just hard for us to see that he always seemed so sleepy and just very lethargic. Um, I mean, he wasn't very engaged at all in probably about like the last six months. I was getting glimmers of recognition and not even every time I would see him. And I know that was the point when he did speak about it, like if I can really no longer recognize you, that's, he really wanted that to be, you know, it, it, it. And I think if he had decided to take his own life, I would have understood. I'm sure I would have had more emotions about it. You know, grief is funny, but he talked about it so much with me growing up that if he really felt that that was the, his best option. I, I do think that would have been okay. It would have been all right with it. I'm an advocate for assisted suicide or euthanasia. You know, when here in California, we do have the Death with Dignity Act, but it doesn't apply to people like your dad or my mom, because obviously my mom is not in her right mind. And as, as much as I would like for people to just trust me, you know, why should they? And you know, might just be trying to preserve my inheritance or something. I think I would like to go to like a psychologist and an attorney and maybe you'd have to do them together and basically fill out a legal form that says I'm in my right mind currently. And if I ever get like this, it's time to pull the plug because she's in a memory care residence. They were full until about a year ago they renovated the entire place and i think i think the renovation pushed a lot of people over the edge they had a lot of the residents pass away some of them moved out which wasn't unusual families run out of money a gal my mom was really close to was getting really aggressive and obnoxious which was really sad because she was kind of fun to be with her and my mom were both named diane so <laughs> It'd be like, me and the two Dianes are going to the park or whatever. And it was kind of fun to be with the two of them because it, it was like a buffer. Yeah. Um, they would talk to each other and I could listen to them ramble on about silly stuff. And it was nicer. But then she got really paranoid. I showed up one day and she had literally a lap and arm load full of clothes and I, I saw her and I said, oh my goodness, why do you have all your laundry there? Would you like me to help you put that away? And she just clutched it and looked at me like I was trying to steal her last dollar. I was like, okay. And I saw her on her birthday, which was the end of October. And then she was gone and the staff's like, oh yeah, well, our daughters moved her out. And it took a while to, to get the reasoning. But a lot of it was because she was getting really aggressive. And that's hard, you know, when they've got 30 people and there's six caregivers, and if you've got one person being aggressive, it's a challenge. But I know from talking to people and listening to people and reading stuff online that there's so many family members, spouses especially, that want to keep their loved one home forever, to, you know, which isn't always an option. And I'm sure your mom struggled with the decision to move him to a memory residence. You know, did, what was, what was the deciding factors for her? How did she make that choice? Yeah, she did go back and forth a little bit, but when he moved out, I believe, cause they're both about, they're both about the same age. So I think he was thir 57 and originally it wasn't just like a memory care. It was, it was like a, was it a locked facility? I don't believe it was. I mean, they didn't let you out if they knew you. So it was you know, like assisted like, living? Kind of. I mean, yeah, you had the meals and it, it was actually really beautiful. And he appreciated older architecture. And so she chose it for its geography 
for like a lot of the outdoor space. They had things to do. And he was still able to like be mobile. He made friends there and was able to like recognize them. And my dad at that time was still um, generous and funny and he would still was able to play the piano there. And she really had a hard time, but he was getting to the point of, you know, he'd be home and I would check on him too. And my mom would be, she works full time, but her schedule is more part time. And he would leave the stove on or the something on the stove top and burn popcorn. And luckily the smoke alarm would go off so he'd hear it, but just, he one time left a dog in the car, you know, just things like that. He got violent and frustrated because I honestly think he thought he was like in a different time and space and was having a memory of something else and it triggered this. And so he was getting violent at times or he would get so angry and walk off and just leave in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that he was starting to get lost on hikes he was getting violent. We were worried for his safety. I was, I got locked in a room once or twice here myself because he didn't know I was here. Just things like that were happening. We, things were getting lost all the time. And so there was a lot of feeling like being gaslit. And she was like, I'm young. I'm st- she was still in the middle of her business growing and was like, I love him, but I, I can't do well by him. And I want to be able to love him and not just be completely resentful and know that he is also taken care of. And she didn't want her life to just be all about managing him at home with a caregiver at home uh, because she was still young mm-hmm. and, but she was, completely active and great and their caregiver. She didn't visit him every day and I don't think she needed to. He had a cell phone for a while and, you know, would call us way too much (laughs) on it because he would forget. But in the end, it was the best decision for her safety, for his safety. But it, it wasn't easy to make. To a lot of people, they seemed to judge close family and friends thinking it was too early. But sometimes it's easier in a way when it might seem too early, we've been told, because then they can acclimate and get more used to living uh, somewhere else. We've been told. I don't know if it's true, but. I've, I've heard that from other people. I've talked to people who, like us, waited too long. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, my mom lived with my dad, and there have been situations that I've been in where I'm like, I totally understand why he did what he did. He had a donated kidney. And when you have a live kidney or a live organ donation, they usually last at least 20 years. His lasted nine, eight, from 20, 2009 to 2017. That sounds like eight. And he had other chronic illnesses. But there was the first day that I had to take my mom for this you know, urgent ultrasound. You know, it took six hours, 12 phone calls. It's like, it was urgent on my end. It wasn't urgent on the medical end. So frustrated. I was so frustrated. I'm like literally driving, talking to my husband on the phone. And I said, now I understand why my dad essentially self-terminated because he didn't want to go back on dialysis and he didn't tell anybody. And it frustrates me because he would have died and she would not have known what was going on. And somebody would have come over and discovered, you know, a Halloween horror site, you know, not at Halloween. And it's just, there's just times. And I think he was just exhausted. He did not have a lot of patience with her. He had almost no patience with her. You know, he would say something to her. And then she'd, you know, like, what, huh? And he'd just snap and just, you know, he was very um, basically rude. And I think a lot of it was because he didn't understand. It's not just memory loss. I mean, there's a lot of things that goes on the further they get with Alzheimer's. You know, it's, it's not just forgetfulness. There's, you know, like 
using the wrong words. That's a big one right now with my mom. So I understand where he was at and they would have been so much happier if he would even have considered an adult day program for her, which I had researched and he just refused. Or if they had considered going into an assisted living where somebody else worries about the upkeep, food, activities, you know, they, he could have kept his life and not have to worry about anything else and other than what they were doing. And I've talked to so many people who are like, yeah, we waited too long. So when we moved my mom into the memory care, it took her two months to acclimate. The first two months were a nightmare. I would show up, I go on Mondays to visit. I would show up and she'd burst into tears and cry and, oh, thank God you're here. And, oh God, it was horrible. It was just, because she didn't remember that anybody had been there. Like my sister goes on the weekends and then I would be there on Monday and her sister would go once or twice a month. So it wasn't like it was Monday to Monday that she didn't see anybody. The day that she stopped bursting into tears was one of the best days. (laughs) She was um, trailing behind some resident for a long time. She's been there two and a half years. So for like probably at least a year, always these ladies like, I got to use a phone. I got to get the hell out of here. I got to call my daughter. <laughs> it was <just> like, <laughs> like, okay. It was, you know, or my favorite is, you know, I got to find the phone book, which, you know, you are probably not old enough to remember phone books. Like no, I, did. I remember, but that's pretty funny. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I tried to, t- I've learned now not to argue, but I tried to convince the one friend that ended up very, um, paranoid that, you know, I said, get your daughter's phone number and, and you can use my phone to call her. Well, I don't remember what that is. Okay. Well, the next time daughter, and I knew the daughter's name is here, have her write it down and then you can give it to me and I'll put it in my phone so we can call and you won't need a phone book. That was, it was just like, <laughs> I know I'm like, <laughs> it was like, I was just talking to hear myself chat because it wasn't, you know, I was essentially arguing with her and you just can't argue with somebody that's got a brain disease. So that, Oh no. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, that's why I'm, I started the podcast too, is to help educate people. And because it, there is so much more to this disease. And when you don't learn from other people that have been there, you don't read, go to support groups, whatever, listen to podcasts. I think you really do yourself a disservice because I, I feel personally that understanding makes it easier to deal with my mom. I'd like to say a lot easier, but that's probably an exaggeration. But you said that family and close friends thought your mom was being premature on moving him to a care facility. It was was split. There were some people who totally supported it. There were some people who, um, yeah, they thought it was too early, but I just don't think they saw how far it was and I I, luckily my mother and I have been on the same page pretty much the whole time and if there have been some minor agreements we've we have great communication that we'll always talk about it um so I do feel lucky in that way that I don't carry any like resentment about the way he was cared for or anything like that or the way that she dealt with things and the way that I dealt with things more on a personal level. Which is good because a lot of families end up very divided, which is very sad. Yeah, I, I've heard a friend of hers, I think the children are trying to take care, uh, take, what is it? They don't like the way that she's doing it, supposedly, although she thinks it's more about money because they don't show up for the father at all. And so they want to take away her custody or rights over him i forget the the real terminology but it's it's awful they're really making it really tricky for her and she's she works in that kind of nursing caregiving industry as well and she's like i see it all the time and people take over just for the money and then they actually don't take care of the person and so she's really fighting them on that but i it's just a, a mix of such terrible things because dealing with the spouse and somebody who's in that state is already um, 
yeah, it's just, it's awful. And on the decline notes, what you were talking about to look for is not just early warning signs, but my dad, he declined pretty quickly and he stopped just like walking mm. in uh, November, pretty much. He kind of started to forget. So he was like shuffling really, really teeny small steps. And um, so he was kind of bedridden for the last like five or six months. They would take him out in a wheelchair, but he really did take that sharp decline of forgetting how to do certain physical things. And um, yeah, that was hard to watch, but. Yeah, my mom. Par for the course. Yeah, that's how they all end up bedridden unless something takes them sooner. My mom has the visual processing is shot. So when we're walking, if we transition from, you know, a hard pavement surface to grass, even if it's all flat and level, she literally slams on the brakes, which, you know, the top half of her is still moving and the bottom head's like, I know she's going to fall because she just is so concerned about falling. She literally walks bent over watching her feet and you know because she thinks that's going to protect her so she doesn't step on something but it's you know and i can't convince her that watching her feet is going to initiate ending up on her face on the cement and over the weekend i was descending some stairs and the way the light was going through the railing it was a kind of a decorative railing so where the edge of the stair was there was a shadow in a different place it was really confusing. Now I knew cause you know, stairs have a certain, you know, run and rise. And so it's like, yeah. you know, step, 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 you're fine. But what looking at the cement stairs and they were all one color with these funky shadows, I was like, Holy crap. If my mom was here, <laughs> she would not, I'd have to like, like grab her head or I don't know how I would have gotten her down those stairs because it was confusing to me. And I knew it was a shadow of the decorative railing and I knew where the edges of the steps were physically. But when I looked at them, it was like, wow, this is really kind of trippy. And I, I don't know why I didn't think about snapping a picture of it with my phone because it was a really good example of visual processing being really confusing. And that's where she's at. It's like what she sees doesn't translate to what it actually is in her brain or, you, you know, you can like, I've got three golden retrievers and sometimes I have a cute photo and I'll be like, Oh, Hey, you want to see a cute photo of the dog? And, and she'll be glancing around at the phone and all around. The phone. It's like, yeah, mind. no, I've seen that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that was hard because two years ago, so she'd been in the memory care about six months. I realized my daughter is 14 years older than my niece. So my daughter's almost 28. My niece is almost 14 and her brother is 10, almost 10 and a half. So I'm like, this is the first year the grandkids aren't going to have anything from their grandparents. Well, I can't do anything about grandpa being gone, but you know, I can help my mom do a really simple craft that I knew that at least the two granddaughters would like, and then thankfully I did decide that we, she should do one for the grandson, even though he probably, it'll be a long time before he appreciates it probably just because he's male. And it was a, my mom was always really creative. She did sewing, she did woodworking, she, all kinds of stuff. And this was like toddler level easy. I mean, it was just, you couldn't screw it up. And I had to keep reminding her what we were doing why we were doing it, you know, and, and how to do it, even though there wasn't really a how. It was like, just pick colors and put them here. And it was a nightmare. And we have not done any of those ever again, because I thought it was just memory. I thought, oh, well, she's forgetting why we're doing this. So I just keep reminding her. Now I realize it's because her visual processing was crappy. She couldn't, you know, just, she, I tried to get her to sign Love Grandma, that was beyond her. It took half an hour to get her to sign her initials on two of the tiles that we were working on. It was like, OMG. And then my poor sister had to take her to get a state ID card because her driver's license disappeared. So she had no ID and you have to sign it on the like electronic screen. That's way beyond my mom. 
And after I think 10 minutes, the gal at the DMV had to keep like clicking the button because it would like go to sleep or, you know, it would just stop. And at one point, one point the gal at the DMV looked at my sister. She goes, I have to go get something over there. I'll be back in a few minutes. And my sister signed it. And the gal came back and it was like, that was yeah. just weird. You know, that you can't, you'd think signing your name is almost instinctive, you know, like muscle memory, but she couldn't even do that. And part of it was, it was on the electronic screen, but she wouldn't have been able to do it on a form either. It's just, those are the kind of things that I don't think people who haven't learned about the disease don't understand. And it just makes you want to scream and run out into the parking lot is what I always said. Yeah, it's a very non-linear way of things breaking down and changing and constantly checking in with yourself about like your own expectations of this person and what they used to be or what you think they should be able to do because having those expectations is not going to serve you anymore. They're never going to get better. They're off in another time zone, practically. They're off maybe they think they're with their mom who is dead. So I had to really work on just when I was with my dad, it was always easy for me at a certain point. If I needed to feel like I needed to say something to him and I was ready for him to not be able to hear it or not even capable of hearing anything or I, I'm probably not explaining that well, but it was, easy once I was able to just be present with my dad and whatever he wanted to say or not say was fine. The anticipation of the visit was always really hard for me, knowing what he had become or what new thing he might be able to not do anymore. And then leaving him was always really hard too because it was just really sad. Mm -hmm. It was very sad to see my dad who was such a goofball and kind of a wacky, dark humor person um, become a bit of a shell, essentially. He sounds like somebody I would totally have gotten along great with, because that describes me. I'm creative. And when my dad was on hospice, the hospice staff, like they really appreciated my morbid sense of humor. And I thought, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. <laughs> Yeah, They might think it's a compliment, but considering the situation, it seemed a little odd, but I have the same thing with my mom. I've, I try really hard to take her out of the residence and go do something that is enjoyable for her, which is getting harder because walking, you know, if, if we just go to the park yeah. to watch kids, which is what she loves to do, walking across the grass is treacherous, even at, you know, a city park where the grass is sure. totally yeah. level. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's beginning harder and harder. And then now because she's got this situation going on with her kidney, there's a lot of times where she feels like I got to go to the bathroom right now. And you're like, okay. And you, you go to take her and she's just standing there staring at you. Like, what's the matter with you? And it's like, you said you had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm trying to help you. And, um, that she'll go to the bathroom and then she comes back. We went, when we did the CT scan, I think it was, I took her to Starbucks for just a nice, you know, drink just so that all of her memories, what there are, you know, her instinctive memory with me is not, ew, she takes me places I don't want to go, which defeats the purpose of taking her out and doing enjoyable things. She, we were literally five minutes from her residence. And when we got there, it was dinner time for them. So I'm trying to get her seated and comfortable. And she's grabbing the crotch of her, her pants. going, I'm dripping everywhere. I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, no, you're not. And she doesn't like help. You know, like, oh, great. Yeah. Oh, she's terrible about that. She, you know, it's, we're both in California. It's been hot. And when we were leaving Starbucks, the curb from the sidewalk into the parking lot was a lot higher than standard, which is kind of interesting. And so that caused, you know, issues because we weren't too sure how we were going to step into the street. And I'm trying to, I said, here, let me 
take my hand and, and that'll help you keep balanced while you step into this parking lot. You know, I'm trying to word it so that she doesn't think that she needs help. She really doesn't. Like, but her balance is fine. It's her brain that's screwed up. Well, she goes to reach out to touch this van that was parked next to my car. And I just grabbed her hand and said, don't touch that. It's hot. <laughs> like, oh man, I sound like my, sound like her. Sound like I did when my daughter was little. And so then I just held her hand while she stepped into the parking lot. And as soon as both feet were on the parking lot service, she jerks her hand out of mine and goes, that's okay then. And I'm like, oh my God. You know, it's like, She's going to fall. I know she's going to fall. She's going to burn herself on a hot car. She's going to fall down. People are going to think I'm abusing her. It'll, it'll add to the fact that we like to go watch children. So if I don't say that carefully, people who aren't familiar with her situation look at me like, uh, what are you guys going to go to? <laughs> We're going to the pool because we like to watch the children. <laughs> we like, like to watch the children swim. Yes. <laughs> There's a, a park here in my town that has the splash zone so that it's not a pool, but the kids can run around in the water. She loves that. We can sit right on the edge of the sidewalk in the shade. It's all flat, works great. And we love to go there. <laughs> she loves to go there. I like to take her because it makes her happy. So hopefully, I don't know how much that we'll be able to do next summer and now we're getting into fall. So I have to find indoor places that are enjoyable to take her and that'll be a challenge, but I don't know. We're going to stick close to a bathroom because she feels like she's got to go when she really doesn't. And it's like, ay, ay, ay. it's not fun. So you said, um, your dad's dad, your paternal grandfather is still living, but he has dementia. Yeah. I, I think he's had dementia since his fifties. Uh, <laughs> looking back on behavior. I do that. My mother has cited when she started meeting my dad's family when they were like 20. Uh, yeah, it sounds like he's had dementia just forever. And it is, I, it's, I find it really disheartening and sad that he's basically been in a home for definitely 20 years. Oh, he, wow. wa he wasn't able to live by himself after his wife had died. And he's been on hospice for a while. He's had like bladder cancer that hasn't killed him it's been very manageable and i don't know my uncle says that they have to take care of it when it comes up because it can be painful but it's not lethal the way that it is but he's still eating he's been on hospice i think over six months but he's still he's still eating um i don't know why he would want to keep living i think he's about 94 93 yeah, that's yeah. like my mom will make comments and sometimes I, I, especially in the last couple months, it's like, I want to try to find a way of saying, you know, it's okay if you just want to quit. <laughs> I haven't really found the right terminology. It's like, you know, but I, I, she doesn't know she's got a problem. Although yesterday she did say multiple times that her brain didn't, isn't working too well. And at one point she actually said that her brain was dying. And I thought that's pretty interesting because that's the first time I've heard that. It makes me wonder, is like, is she actually aware that, you know, her brain isn't working or is it just, you know, most of what she says is just like verbal nonsense. Yeah. I don't know if it was just verbal nonsense that happened to make sense. It's very, it's a little strange, but yeah, I, I I have fears that she'll live like this for another 10 or 15 years. The neurologist last at the very beginning of this year said, well, if nothing else happens, she could easily live another 10 years. And I thought, Oh yeah, yeah. I don't want to deal with this for 10 more years. You know, we had a business together and I knew she was having memory issues and she wouldn't admit to them. So I had to kind of like surreptitiously supervise what she was doing because and I say this story all the time, I have to find a new one, but it's the best example. She would take orders from clients and not write down directions, due dates. Nobody else could complete the order because there was nothing. I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? And one day she said, well, I didn't take that order. You know, one of the employees did. And I was like, mm, no, <laughs> this is Melania's handwriting. This is your handwriting. They're not even similar. So that was a really not fun day. And that was a day then I realized I'm going to have to like really monitor what she's doing so that we don't have issues. And then 
I don't know which came first, but I had a really good client call and just unload with expletives and F-bomb. I'd never heard her talk like that. I was like, yikes, what's going on? She had been dealing with my mom on an order and my mom just kept not getting it right, not getting it right, not getting it right. So she finally lost her cool. She's like, I'm like done. I'm like, you tell me what you've been telling mom and I will make sure it gets done properly. And fortunately she did remain a client after that, but oh yeah, yeah. You know, that was like late nineties, early two thousands. So here we are. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh no. We've been dealing with this a long time. Right. It's, she started not writing down directions on orders when she was my age. I'm almost 53, but it was just occasional. And it's like, oh, well, you know, we all do stuff like that. You think, well, I'm going to take care of it or you get distracted and you forget to finish filling out the form, you know, stuff just happens, but it happened more and more frequently. And it got to the point where she couldn't remember what they told her. So it was like, yikes. So if I heard her just kind of, chatting it up with a client, I'd go out there and join the conversation and slide the order over. And go, oh, so what are we going to be doing for so-and-so today? And just, I was, I hope it was subtle enough that she didn't realize what was going on. Not that she remembers now. Now she tells people I'm her best friend and she's known me forever. And it's like, yeah, my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it is kind of nice when she tells people that I'm her best friend. Cause it's like, well, okay, that's could be worse could be that that annoying woman that drags her to the doctor all the time <laughs> mm. but you said it was hard dealing that knowing your grandfather's still around is that just because just i i think i'm just in a might sound terrible but i i think of things like efficiently and the best use of things and i know if I, this would happen to me i wouldn't want to live for very long and it it's frustrating to think of someone just living bedridden and he's kind of angry and surly and not super nice and just being taken care of for the last 20 something years and I'm like what well, I just I don't know what he could possibly be holding on to I don't know what there is to look forward to for him food I think is the last pleasure for people who are ill but I I'm not upset about it, like with father or dad, their whole thing, his dad being still alive. Um, I don't know, things just happen. For some reason, that just doesn't bother me. I'm glad that my dad got out as soon as he did. Really. Yeah, a shorter path through this disease is definitely better. Yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised to hear because everything we've heard, at least we were told, oh, it's early onset. It's usually within 10 years of diagnosis is usually uh, is death. So I'm surprised to hear that your mother has been around for so long. Well, she was diagnosed in September of 2011. Now, like I said, we all knew she was sick way before then. So what do I got? Three years? Two, 20, 20, two more years. So we'll see. Maybe, maybe she will go 10 years from diagnosis. Who knows? But yeah, it's I haven't met very many people who've been on this journey with a loved one this long. I've only, I've only heard of one other person whose parent lived with Alzheimer's for 30 years. And I thought, oh, yeah. Oh. No, thank you. <laughs> like, yeah. Cause it was, as I've heard dementia is like the broader term, like Alzheimer's will affect you physically. So that's why in my brain, Alzheimer's is something that is more degenerative. But I guess, maybe not. Um, yeah. It'll be interesting to see what they learn in the next decade. I'm just hoping, you know, with my family history, I try to do all the things that they tell you to do to either prevent getting it, or if you do get it, it prevents the, um, the worst effects of it for a long time. Like I've talked to people who say, Oh, well, my mom, you know, ate organic and exercised and did this, did, 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 and she still got Alzheimer's. It's like, yes, but she might have had it 10 years sooner if she didn't take care of herself. So it's, they're, they're discovering new things all the time. And I find it really interesting. And I, I just hold out hope that I'm doing all the right things. And I do take after my dad's side of the family. 
So maybe <laughs> that's a benefit. <laughs> There's a lot of diabetes on his side of the family, a lot of obesity on his side of the family. I don't have the diabetes, but man, if I walk past something fattening, my body's like, oh, we'll just store that right here. <laughs> so, it's just like, you know, I lost a hundred pounds and I kept 90 of it off for four years until I turned 50. And then all of this stuff with my parents and my mom. And it's like, you know, it's like, now I got to lose 20 again, which after 50 is a lot harder. So I'm hoping know. that's still pretty amazing. That sounds, thank you. Yeah. Amazing. It's, we were out of town for five days and it's like, ugh, I can't, I just can't do restaurant food three times a day. It's just, ugh. And I, I went, we were in Denver and I went on this scenic drive and I stopped and I had a sandwich and a big thing of fruit and I stopped and had lunch next to this lake and it was so peaceful. And it's like being out in nature is really restorative. I was really surprised how much better I felt just sitting there reading my book, having fruit and a sandwich, talking to people as they walk by. It was just, it was so peaceful and beautiful. I'm like, I'm going to go to the city park and stuff more often, try to incorporate a little more nature in my life. That's not riding my bike outside or being in the backyard or walking the dogs because it was just so, it was amazingly restorative, but yeah, I'm back home and I'm like, I've got a completely insane week. <laughs> like, uh, and then of course we flying out of Denver plane is three hours late. It's like, oh, I'm done with Denver. I'm not flying through there or in there, skipping that airport for the rest of my life, which I did say a year ago. And then my husband ended up at a conference in Denver. I'm like, ugh. We talked about driving, but it's like two days. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. We did it once in 2013. We did it. We, I think we managed it in about I don't know. We did it overnight. So it was like a 24 hour drive. We won't be doing that again. We're not, we're way too old for that. <laughs> we were trying to get to a specific town for a meet, you know, so we could meet up with people that met at a certain time. He didn't even remember the meeting. He was so tired. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> yeah. I was like, and I'm typical Californian. The sun goes down, my battery goes out and I'm asleep. So that's the other thing I try to make sure to do is sleep really well, make it really dark, make it cool throw the dog off the bed or all three of them. <laughs> Fortunately, mm -hmm. only one sleeps on the bed, but he gets warm. So he gets down now. So it's better. But yeah, my dad's mom is, um, 101 and a half. And there are times when I talk to her and I get the impression that she feels like her loss is worse than mine. And it's frustrating because I guess I realized you lost a son, but I lost my dad and my mom. So it's not, it's, it's a hard journey for everybody and everybody handles it differently. And it's just, it's not cool. Yeah. Comparative grief isn't helping anybody either. No. And we have to remember to be kind to each other and just, you know, like I don't make judgments. My sister's got, like I said, school age kids. So if she can't go this weekend and see mom, that's life, you know, you have to pick and choose. And I would much rather that she do things with her kids while they're still kids. I mean, my niece just started high school. That makes me feel super old. Um, then sit around and listen to my mom babble about God knows what. And then her kids are grown and out of the house and then she's missed all this stuff. So, cause my daughter, you know, my daughter grew up with my mom and my mom started having issues well, my daughter was like in high school and college. So, you know, it was, it was different. And I don't feel like I missed anything with her dealing with my mom. It's just, it's hard. It's really hard when you're not that old and dealing with a parent with this disease, which you obviously understand very well. Yeah. I definitely feel it um, slowed down things for me in the way of career and yeah it, I think it really did put a bit of a pause on that it gave me I, like I had to find a spiritual or some kind of self practice to make things easier for myself and I did and that's been that's been amazing so in a weird way I guess that's some kind of a 
a silver lining with that, but I, I've had other friends who lost parents um, kind of young and, or even just around a similar age. Like I, I had one friend who lost her dad and she took some time off from college around like 21 or 22. And it seems like in the last three years, she's been finally kind of getting out of that. And that, I think that was over eight years ago. So it's, you know, taking care with her, of her mother and figuring that out. It, you know, just, it does take its toll. Yeah, it does definitely kind of shove you onto a different path, whether you want it or not. Yeah, like yeah it really does. I've mentioned on previous episodes, my dad just assumed that my mom would come live with me. And when he was making this assumption, my daughter still lived here and we did not have a spare bedroom. And like I said, my husband and I are self-employed. So we do have flexibility and I do work from home, but I couldn't work if she was here. Not at all. I would have to have a caregiver to attend to her while I did my stuff, which just seems a little frivolous, but I know that it's not. So there was some resentment with that assumption because it just wasn't, you know, he never talked about it with me, you know? So it was just like, what, you want me to just hang her in the closet? What do you want me to do with her? And I had just turned 50. So it's like, I'm not ready for my life to come to an almost stop while I wait for her to follow you into the next whatever. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's hard because I feel like I have to make all these really hard decisions and I'm, I'm good at it. But after he died, the first, he died on a Thursday night. So like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I just told my husband, I'm hungry. Find me something to eat. I'm whatever, you know, it's like, I just made him make all the decisions. I'm like, I'm done making decisions. I'm not making any decisions till for a while. And it was about three or four days. And it was like, okay, I'm, I'm kind of over that feeling, but man, the first couple of days I'd like stare at my clothes and I couldn't figure out what to wear. It was like, this is really weird. So it's, it definitely derails things and it's how we deal with that. That's important. And it's, I kind of feel like I have to keep finding new coping techniques because of the way she's declining and additional health issues, making it even worse. It's like, I wasn't expecting that. I don't know why. It's just kind of the way it goes. But I really appreciate you talking to everybody today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and sharing some of your stuff too. I try. That way I'm not just sitting here making making noise so people know I'm still sitting on my side of the screen. <laughs>